Thank you guys for joining us. We're here for our first ever Ask the Expert video here on Facebook Live with Dr. Lewis Jett, Horticultural Specialist for the WVU Extension Service. Lewis, thank you for joining us. Glad to be here. Um, we're going to uh, dive right into some of the questions you guys have submitted to us on the Facebook page here. Uh, we'll start with Tiffany Ferguson, who seems to have an issue with the place she's hoping to grow her garden. Here's what she says. I bought a house last year and started a garden. Last year, a big area was just a swampy bog. I put all of my grass trimmings, uh, veggie peels, coffee grounds, etc. in it and tilled it this spring. It went from standing a uh, standing water swamp to just super heavy wet mud. It's still too wet to plant in that area, though. I added a bunch of peat moss, but I'm afraid of making the soil too acidic if I add any more. What else would you recommend adding to make it usable this year? <clears throat> well, I think on that issue, um, you know, adding more organic matter <clears throat> like, like you did before, <clears throat> that sort of just absorbs the moisture and sort of makes it more, more um, saturated and, and holds more water. So the, the real issue here, I think, um, is to turn this um, site into a raised bed, to make a raised bed and to uh, <clears throat> either bring in new soil that you have from another part of your garden, or you can certainly manufacture your soil. And, and you know, peat moss you, you mentioned earlier can be added. Um, you can mix peat moss with compost and soil. I have a new publication coming out on creating a raised bed. There's so many different ways to create raised beds out of different materials. Um, so I, I will, you know, um, have that uh, accessible to the gardeners uh, fairly soon. But I, I think if you have drainage issues, that certainly would solve it. And raised beds have so many advantages for, you know, making it easier to, to garden, do square foot gardening, um, to do more perennial gardening. Um, it's well suited for that. If you didn't want to build a raised bed, then the other option would be to sort of, um, uh, uh, manage the drainage by putting, uh, you know, sort of drainage pipes or, or ditching it so that it drains a little better. But um, I think your best option at this point is to um, sort of reclaim the, the site by turning it into a, a permanent, um, excuse me, permanent raised uh, bed. So uh, you mentioned that raised beds have some other benefits, including being able to grow things longer into the year. Is that right? Yes. <clears throat> yeah, the raised beds, you know, certainly keep the soil <clears throat> warmer because there's, there's more surface area for the sun to um, warm the soil. You know, it's, it's making the soil, obviously the soil or the root zone is deeper because your, your bed is high. It's, it's, it's um, you know, 10, 12, 18 inches high, depending on your, whatever height you, you have or you want. We just built some that were 18 inches high, some that were 10 inches high. Uh, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't construct a raised bed if it was less than 10 inches. I think there's minimal advantages to that. <clears throat> but you know, it would allow you to um, um, cr to grow crops year-round. I mean, you could overwinter crops in these raised beds, turn them into cold frames. Um, you can overwinter carrots and spinach and kale and crops like that. Or you can overwinter perennial herbs uh, or strawberries um, or, or something. Or asparagus, they're very well suited for asparagus. Um, we're in into asparagus season here now, so I mean, people are starting to think about it. But I think just for long, <clears throat> excuse me, for long-term planning, I would think about constructing the raised bed on this site. Um, next question. Marky Shamblin has a question about microgreens, which is one of our grow this crops for 2020. Um, they, they say simply, what are microgreens? When do we harvest them? And can we harvest them more than once? Yeah, microgreens are an excellent you know, salad crop. I mean, they're just, they're, they're sort of a, an additive to a salad or sometimes a replacement for spinach or lettuce in a salad. They're just miniature plants um, <clears throat> that are harvested at a very early stage of growth. Most of the, most of them are um, uh, sort of in the cabbage family, like turnips, radishes, kohlrabi, <clears throat> cabbage, um, and then there are also uh, beets, uh, chard, many of the herbs, basil, Lovage, uh, celery, even so, they're just they're just seeded in uh, in trays or or pots, very very thickly, and then <clears throat> they're allowed to grow to about oh, four inches high, and then they're clipped um, usually with scissors, and um, uh, so you're just you know using them as young seedlings. So they're not they're not sprouts. Sometimes you can buy you can get sprouts <clears throat> at you know, restaurants or 
that are added. Those are just seeds that have germinated. But the, these um, uh, microgreens are seeds that have germinated. Then they form their first true leaf. And that's when you start cutting them. So there's the cotyledons or the seed leaves that come out first. And then the leaves right after that are the true leaves. That's when they're sniffed. And um, they can be, they can be uh, cut multiple times, depending on how, how high you cut them in the um, container. If you cut them below the growing point, which is the cotyledons, they won't regrow. But if you, if you keep cutting them above the cotyledons, they'll continue to, to grow new leaves. So you can do multiple cuttings on them that way. But they're highly nutritious. Um, there are many seed companies that have uh, pre-mixed um, microgreen uh, seeds that are already mixed up for you. You can, or, the, or a gardener can mix their own and create their own mix. But you know, you, depending on whether you like mild or spicy, I mean, if you want more mustards in them, that's going to be more of a spicy or hotter mix. But if you want more milder types of microgreens, then that's mostly the cabbages and the, and the broccoli and the, the other things like that that are mixed together. But they're an excellent, they're an excellent windowsill crop, uh, uh, crop that can be done, um, uh, food crop that can be grown in, inside the house. And they reach, it's funny to say maturity because the whole idea is that you're harvesting them before they're mature. But I mean, they, they reach the point where you can harvest them fairly quickly, right? Yeah. I think within, Oh, sometimes after they, you know, they emerge in about um, four or five days after they're uh, seeded. And then within two weeks, they're harvested, <clears throat> depending on, you know, how much light they're getting and all that. But, but the main thing I think, and this is stressed in the, in the grow this, um, guide is not to overwater them. I mean, not to try to bo uh, bottom water them or, or soak the pot in a water rather than uh, overhead water them or, or douse them in water. But um, very fast growing crop, yeah. And um, you just need to clip them before they get too big. Um, and while they're- And what's the, what's the benefit of watering them from beneath rather than spraying them from the top? Well, I think when you, when you water any, any crop, I mean, uh, any garden crop, um, the same way. I mean, uh, most plants don't like wet leaves. They just don't like water on the leaves. I mean, it just, it stresses them. It creates disease problems. Uh, it mats them down, kind of packs them down sometimes. So it's better just to water the roots, which is what the, uh, the organ of the plant is designed for taking water um, is, is, are the root system. So it's better just to soak the pot in a, in a tray of water um, and then just bottom water it. Our, uh, our next question comes from Sharon Wickline. She writes, I got six pea seeds in the mail. I'm assuming from Grow This. Um, will these feed a family of two or are they not worth the trouble? So uh, what, what would you say to Sharon? How much does a, a pea plant usually yield? That's a very good question. Um, yeah, I have never thought about peas uh, from a single plant uh, perspective, but um, it's an interesting crop. I mean, it's an early garden crop and people need to sow them, you know, as early as they possibly can in the garden, you know, according to the garden calendar that we make those recommendations. Um, they are not, I mean, compared to green beans, they're not the highest yielding legume that you can grow. Um, uh, my estimates on, on peas are they produce 25 pounds per hundred foot of row. So that would mean they would produce, you know, about a quarter pound of peas per foot. And if you do the math on that, I mean, they're normally seeded an inch apart. So, you know, six, six pea seeds would, would, not, would not feed uh, me because <laughs> I love peas. So you'd really, I would, I, I would, you know, you'd want more. So I, I think the main thing about, you know, just getting a sampling of, of seeds or something is to try it to see if you like to grow it, if you'd like to eat it, you know, and then if you do that, then you just scale up. You just buy more seeds, you know, um, you know, peas, peas like cool weather. So they're a spring crop and they're also a fall crop. So you, you have another chance to grow them this year in the fall. So if you like them this spring, or if you didn't want to get more seed this spring, or weren't able to get more seed this spring, then you can, you could buy seed and sow them in the fall, usually in August, and then they would be producing peas in October. But they're an excellent crop. I mean, but I think, you know, the six would, would certainly give you a sampling of the peas. Um, and I don't know if these are sugar snap peas or snow peas or shell peas, so that's a difference there. But they're not, you know, they're, they're not, they don't load up with a lot of pods like beans do sometimes. So they need a little bit more of them to get, uh, get more peas. <clears throat> 
it sounds like though i mean if if she plants them and enjoys them could she save the seeds and then do it again in fall well there are open pollinated peas um and uh, that which which are uh, varieties that you could save the seed and they would they would be true to type <laughs> if you sow if you sowed them again um, these could very well be hybrids and, and that would mean that they would have different characteristics if you save the seed from them. But um, the whole principles of genetics were based on saving uh, pea seeds and evaluating peas based on how they uh, um, you know, were wrinkled or sweet or, or starchy from generation to generation. So, I mean, you certainly would, certainly would get peas um, and you know, it's just that you may not get exactly what you had before and <laughs> may get something that's a little different. But uh, we love saving seed. I mean, we love encouraging growers or gardeners to save seed. Um, but there are some <clears throat> there are some open pollinated <clears throat> non-hybrid peas out there. Uh, you just have to look in the seed catalog and it'll tell you it'll put an OP after them and that means you can save the seed. But if it's a hybrid, which gives them an F1 after the seed name, that indicates that they're not going to be true to type um, than, what, um, than what the, the original plant was. We got several questions about starting seeds. Um, Lisa Ann Critchfield asked, I start seeds indoors near a window and with a small grow light. They will sprout, but then die. What am I doing wrong? Well, I mean, it sounds like it may be an overwatering issue. I mean, it, you know, whenever you grow a plant, a transplant particularly, it's a balance between light and water. So you could overwater something that doesn't have enough light and it could cause it to, to get what they call damping off, which is a, a fungal disease. Um, so, you know, if they're not getting, if this is not a south facing window or you know, a west facing window, which are the two highest light levels in the home, uh, it's, it's very possible that the, the seedlings are not getting enough light and they're just getting waterlogged and maybe overwatering them too much. But I mean, if, if, if a supplemental light is used, like an LED light or something, that certainly would improve conditions for sure. But I, I don't, you know, without seeing what these plants really look like, it sounds like it's a watering, uh, watering issue to me. So I would, I would sort of, you know, I, I like to just water, you know, let the let the, uh, the potting mix sort of get dry to the touch between watering. So just don't keep it saturated um, constantly. That's that's not good for seedlings. Um, Courtney Bombwell um, says that her indoor sprouts keep falling over. Um, she wonders if an LED light would help. I think a lot, supplemental light would help. Um, you know, it's, it's very possible, even with seedlings like microgreens, they do need they do need you know a fair amount of natural light. Uh, so if they're not getting that in the house, you know, the window sill, then a, then a supplemental light would definitely. Plants will tell you if there's you know, something wrong. I mean, they'll get stretched. The, they'll kind of, kind of turn color, yellowish color, if they're not getting enough light. But normally they kind of stretch out a little bit more than what they normally would because they're trying to seek more light and um, they're, not, um, they're not getting enough light. So yeah, just kind of pay attention to what the, the seedlings are, and plants are, are showing. And then um, an LED light helps. I mean, I, I would think 10, 10 hours a day of light would be would be fine. Eight to ten hours a day would be fine. Okay. Uh, Robin Clark says that her baby tomatoes are laying down. She has three different varieties, and the roots are all straight. What what, what sounds like uh, is going on there? Well, I, I, I uh, that's a good question. Yeah. <laughs> um, I mean, it, it's it's just possible that it needs to be trellised somehow. I'm not sure. I mean. If we're talking about these are tomatoes transplants or seedlings, I don't know. Is that what? Yeah, she did. Referring she to didn't say. She plants? just said full size. Yeah, she said baby, baby tomatoes, plants, uh, right? So, yeah. yeah. Well, again, that might be an issue of them just getting what we call leggy or, or stretch, etiolated is the botanical term for it. Um, it just may be that they're getting uh, the inner nodes, the area between leaves stretches out. You know, again, that's probably a low light issue, but it could also be putting on too much water again. So um, just making sure that the, uh, the seedlings get as much light as they possibly can. You know, even transferring them to net to an outside, you know, sort of a cold frame or something would be would be feasible here 
in the next week or two um, to get enough to get full natural light. So if they're just, you know, if they're bio-endosil now, maybe they're not getting you know, as much natural light as they possibly can. It may be possible to take them out during the daytime, uh, and, you know, when it's above 60 degrees um, and let them get as much natural light and bring them back in during the, the evening when it gets you know, below 50. Um, and um, that would keep them from getting a chilling injury. People love their tomatoes. We, we have another tomato question from uh, Julie Lewis. Love them. <laughs> Uh, she said, would repotting tomato seedlings so they are more buried help produce a more robust plant when it comes time to plant outside? Yeah, I, I tell you, um, the thing about tomatoes, which you know, it's, it's intriguing, is that uh, the bigger the transplant, the bigger the yield. So, and that's just um, uh, a matter of keep repotting, just going up, higher pots, larger pots. I mean, we have a, we have people that even pot, uh, plant tomatoes finally in a gallon size pots or above because they produce big plants and then they fruit earlier and they produce long, larger fruit. So um, uh, tomatoes and peppers are unique by the fact that larger transplants, larger transplants mean larger yields. Not all vegetables are like that. Um, so if they're bumped up from like a jiffy pot into a larger pot, like a four inch pot, or something that's, uh, you know, uh, an average size uh, pot, that would certainly expand the root system on the plant um, and make the plant, you know, start faster, start growing faster, start fruiting faster. <clears throat> so yeah, I'm, I'm definitely in favor of, of large transplants for tomatoes and, and repotting them into larger pots. That's interesting. The larger the transplant, the, the more yield you'll get off the plant. Yeah, I mean, it's, <clears throat> it's, 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 Unique to, to tomatoes and, and peppers and watermelons uh, are like that. But uh, other vegetables, there's no, you never see quite that difference all the time. But um, so, yeah, I think that people that try to grow tomato plants in small containers are going to pay a price because they're, they're not going to produce big size plants when they're planted out in the garden. We'll, we'll stay on the tomato train here. Uh, we have some questions about blight. Uh, Mary Kathleen and Barry Wilkinson want to know, um, they say, our area has suffered an exposure to tomato blight more than five years ago. I've been able to grow cherry and plum tomatoes, even tomatillos, but any full-size tomato turns black before it ripens. What can we do to pick healthy beef steaks again? Uh, that, that sounds like a late blight to me, uh, without seeing it, I, I can't really confirm it. But, but it's interesting that, you know, Roma tomatoes or paste tomatoes, and, and some cherry tomatoes are resistant to it. So yeah, it makes sense that it's not showing any symptoms on those types of tomatoes. So, I mean, on the slicing tomatoes, the beefsteak tomatoes, um, the real strategy for, for late blight is to just make sure you do everything that's, you know, we recommend for growing tomatoes, um, you know, the mulching, the staking, the pruning, um, uh, and, and making sure there's good airflow around the plants. So not planting the plants too close together. I wouldn't plant, I would not plant a beefsteak tomato closer than 36 inches apart. So, um, you know, if, if they're trying to crowd the plants, it'll probably uh, promote this disease problem. The late blight is something that shows up when it gets warm and wet. So it, it's, not, it's not something that we'll see immediately here. Uh, we have more problem with early blight and septoria leaf spot than we do uh, late blight usually. So uh, normally our pathologists, our West Virginia University Extension pathologist, Dr. Raman, will send out pest alerts for uh, late blight as it moves across the state because it moves from other areas into West Virginia. So when that uh, alert goes out, gardeners can um, respond by uh, applying even organic pesticides such as copper, uh, liquid copper, for controlling, um, for helping to control it. Uh, there's some other organic products that are labeled for it as well that gardeners can use. Um, but the main thing I think, you know, is to, uh, not give up. Late blight doesn't always show up. Um, so it, sometimes it'll, it'll show up, sometimes it, you won't see it for a couple of years. Um, but just be prepared that when the alert goes out uh, from the extension service that um, you, you take action and we do some spraying to control uh, uh, the, uh, the disease. It's a fungal disease that um, needs warm, wet weather to grow. 
there are some there are some varieties of tomatoes that are resistant to late blight or tolerant to late blight. Um, the um, Mountaineer Pride, which is uh, released um, from WVU um, last year or the year before last, I should say, has resistance to uh, late blight. So um, it's a it's a version of the uh, the Centennial Tomato, which was released in 1963 by Dr. Gallagher, and so. Uh, if somebody is seeking um, a variety that has resistance to uh, septoria leaf spot and some resistance to early blight, but has pretty darn good resistance to late blight, that would be a, a mountain probably would be a good variety to choose uh, for West Virginia. Um, we have a lot of folks in our program who've, who are gardening for the first time this year. Can you talk just a little bit about what blight is and maybe explain the difference between that early blight that you mentioned and the late blight? Yeah, it's it's sort of depressing sometimes when you grow tomatoes, you try to do everything right, you know, grow a good plant, and then you know, and then sometimes you get just you know wiped out by, <laughs> by a disease such as blight, and it's not really anybody's fault. I mean, it's just you know it's just a natural occurrence. So I mean, here in West Virginia, as you mentioned, Zach, we have three types of blights that are mostly attack tomatoes: are early blight, late blight, and sectorial leaf spot, and um, I would I would bet uh, you would see one of those in every county in West Virginia during the growing season. I mean, um, we see areas of the state that have more septorial leaf spot than they do early blight, and vice versa. But I think it's just a multiple approach to dealing with these diseases. I mean, sometimes you can use genetic resistance, as I mentioned earlier, with the Mountain of Pride. But I think it's just good gardening practices. I mean, I would not grow a tomato if I couldn't stake it. Uh, you can stake it with a you know individual stake, or you can do a cage, or you can tie them to a, a woven wire fence, or a cattle panel, or whatever you want to do. But tomatoes need to be off the ground to keep them from getting disease issues. Because early blight, uh, come, early blight particularly, and septoria leaf spot will come from the soil, the rain splashed soil up on the leaves. So any way you can um, buffer the plant from that exposure to soil either by mulching it and getting it off the ground, it's going to definitely help. And anything to improve airflow around the plant, as I mentioned earlier, um, increasing the distance, the inroad distance between plants is going to help. Um, and um, pruning uh, the plants. Um, if I was growing a, 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 an old time variety of tomato, an heirloom variety, or even some of the hybrids that are fairly big plants, you want to prune or you know, what's called suckering the tomatoes that's done um, before flowering or right at the first flowering and uh, that helps manage the amount of leaves that the plant grows and helps the plant dry out between rains and heavy dews so it doesn't trigger these diseases so these these diseases are fungal diseases that you know uh, they need water to be activated so they they need wet leaves so you know if you have a lot of rain you know you're going to have issues with them um, if, if you overhead water with a garden hose, you're going to trigger these disease problems. So it's best to water bottom water, you know, have a soaker hose or a drip irrigation kit in the garden that just waters the root system, not the leaves. Because everybody who has problems with these diseases tends to have a lot of wet leaves all the time. So if you don't want to, if the gardener doesn't want to use, you know, soaker hoses, then if they're going to water, they should water in the morning and let the plant dry out enough before night. They water in the evening, um, plants gonna stay wet all night and it's gonna trigger that disease issue. But uh, the good news is, I mean, these diseases are manageable. It's just, you know, important to catch the symptoms early. And if they don't, if the gardener doesn't know the symptom immediately, um, our pathologist, Dr. Rahm, is excellent at diagnostics. So uh, going directly to the county agent in your county, um, you know, maybe sending a picture or just a real good description of what you're seeing. And then our, our diagnostic team will, um, will, uh, will diagnose it and give you the, the solutions to correcting it before it gets out of control. You know, that's the main thing. Catch it early before it gets, um, wipes out the garden or wipes out every plant in the garden that's uh, infected. Because early blight, you know, and some of these other diseases attack other plants too. They attack other, other than tomatoes. So they, they have a lot of hosts that they attack. So catching it before it gets uh, widespread is really important. Uh, Mary McCullough had a question about septoria. Uh, she wondered what are the best tomato varieties when you're dealing with septoria and what are the best defenses to use when it hits? It sounds like you've already 
discuss some of the strategies she could use if, if she's dealing with it. But um, what are some of the better varieties that? Well, I mean, you know, I, I think if you look at the seed catalogs, you don't see very many varieties that have resistance to septoria leaf spot. It just doesn't, it's not out there. But the Mountaineer Pride has resistance or, or what we call good tolerance to it. So um, the Mountaineer Pride, which is not widely available. I mean, a lot of commercial seed companies have not produced or have not sold this seed, but it is, it is accessible to gardeners would be a, a choice. Um, and um, Dr. Gallagher has been working very hard over the many years to try to get varieties that are resistant to um, septoria leaf spot and to late blight. So I think that's a step in the right direction. Um, I've just you know perused the seed catalogs and see um, what they list as, as varieties that are resistant to it. I, I'm not aware of any that are. Uh, so it has to be managed from sort of a cultural standpoint, from you know, how well you grow the tomato. And as I already mentioned earlier on, on the cultural practices. Um, some readers are worried about tomato hornworms. Um, and so we got two questions about that. We'll just take them both together. Um, Deborah Crabble asks, how do you present, how do you prevent tomato hornworms from invading your tomatoes? And Judy Barr asks, does borage really help, really work against hornworms? And do you start it inside or so with the tomato plants? Yeah, those are excellent questions. I, I do a lot of tomato research. Uh, we were, we're you know, looking at heirloom varieties um, across the state of West Virginia, Dr. Um, it, it, it really some of these varieties that have a lot of leaves on them, like the old time varieties, they're really susceptible to hornworms. I've had hornworm issues on some of our research plots over the past few years. <clears throat> okay, so the way I manage them, I mean, they're, they're, a, they're really a disturbing pest because they're such a large worm that they eat so much. I mean, they just really defoliate the plant rapidly. I mean, and they never, they never sleep. They just, they just eat at night, they eat during the day. <laughs> Sometimes they go a little deeper in the canopy during the day where it's cooler, but they're still eating. But at night, they're really voracious eaters. So they they can defoliate a plant in just a matter of a couple of days, uh, which is that's terrifying. <laughs> so the way to deal, yeah, it is. They're and they're actually you know pretty uh, pretty terrible looking insect too. If you're not if you don't if you, particularly if you don't like worms, they're just you know something that's five inches long or something <laughs> is not not very pleasant. But um, there's good news here. I mean, um, there are natural predators for them, and and sometimes you know I've seen them in our tomato trials, um, hornworms that have been um, parasitized by the wasp that attacks them. So they, they, they lay eggs on the worm and then the eggs hatch and then actually feed on the, uh, the worm. Uh, it's nature for you. But it's, it's, uh, there are natural predators, um, wasp species that um, attack these hornworms. So if, you, if, if the gardener sees a hornworm that has these white egg casings on them, just don't don't destroy that um, worm because it's going to be sort of a, an incubator for um, um, the other parasites, the other predators to attack other worms later when they when they hatch and, and lay eggs. So you do have some natural uh, control that, that is going on as well. But I, I got to tell you, I mean, um, and this is I tell this to commercial growers, uh, market gardeners, home uh, backyard gardeners. Is just be vigilant and everything. I mean, just look at your plants every day, every other day. You know, um, if if you see something that's chewing out large sections of your leaves, um, yeah, I'd start looking, particularly on tomatoes and peppers and eggplants. It, it seems to favor um, and, and would even attack tomatillos and, and and other things that are related to those. So anything in the tomato family, um, this um, this uh, worm is going to attack. So you might want to, you know, focus on that if you're seeing some defoliation. They're 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 highly camouflaged, so it's sometimes difficult to see them because they're, you know, they, they really um, blend into the canopy fairly well. But you can sometimes see their their um, their excrement, their frass, you know, that's um, that's dropping around the plant. Um, <clears throat> so, given you know the fact that you know you can you can catch them and 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 find them on the plant, you could just physically remove them from the plant. I mean, just, you know, you don't have a lot of tomato plants, that's doable. <clears throat> if you have a fair amount of tomato plants, um, the strategy I use is I use an organic uh, <clears throat> insecticide called Dipel, uh, which is um, all organic. And it, it's usually at most garden centers here in West Virginia, 
it's just a wettable powder <clears throat> or liquid that you, you mix with another with water and then you just spray it on the plant and then anything that eats the plant is killed by this bacteria that's in the spray so it's very effective on worms so dipel for you know corn worms could be used dipel could be used for cabbage worms could be used for corn ear worm all the all the bad uh, worms that we have with, with our garden crops <clears throat> but um getting back to um I, you know i've grown borage i mean i, I love it it's a great um, um uh, bee attractant um you know the flowers are edible uh, the leaves are edible it's an excellent plant for bringing beneficial insects I have not seen any research to show that it repels hornworms. I've read that. I, I just haven't seen the research to, um, to do it. But I gotta tell you, I mean, it would never be bad to grow borage in the garden uh, because it brings in so many beneficial insects. Um, <clears throat> the, um, uh, I think you could, you could sow borage from a seed, um, you know, in, directly in the garden, or you can, you can buy borage transplants at local garden centers. So it's just a matter of, you know, how you want to do it. Um, it's a very fast growing plant, so it wouldn't take very long from seed. <clears throat> but I mean, the, the, the transplants are pretty easy to find, I think, at most, most garden centers. Um, one final thing I did do uh, a few years back is we, we interplanted basil um, with tomatoes, and we, we did feel that that reduced worm issues. It wasn't necessarily hornworms, but it's tomato fruit worm, which is another worm that attacks tomatoes. So you could interplant something like basil, I think, uh, which is well documented to repel certain insects. I just haven't seen any literature, um, scientific literature on borage, but you know, bottom line, growing borage in or around the garden is gonna be a good thing. So I'd, I'd definitely grow it if you could fit it in the garden somewhere. Wor worth a shot, it sounds like. <clears throat> yeah, absolutely, yeah. <laughs> uh, well, we've talked about microgreens, we've talked about peas, talked a lot about tomatoes. Uh, let's before we wrap up, let's get to our final um, grow this crop for 2020 squash. Uh, we have a couple questions about squash from Facebook. Uh, Maria and Don Bosco want to know, can squash grow as well in containers as they do in the garden? Uh, yeah, I mean, most, most crops can be grown in containers, okay? Let me just say that. I mean, if you, it's a matter of, uh, you know, space and size of the container. Uh, honestly, you know, if you look at squashes, and I don't know if we're talking about summer squash here versus winter squash, because they're, they're different. Um, uh, they all have fairly deep root systems, so they need a fairly large volume of soil. So I, I probably wouldn't grow them in less than a five gallon bucket or something like that. But I mean, we have, we have grown, you know, potatoes in buckets and asparagus in buckets and, you know, rhubarb and bu and buckets just make sure you have a drainage hole on it you know you can say so you can you could go down to the you know home depot or lowe's or any garden or any uh, home supplies place and get a bucket and turn it into a container um but i wouldn't put them in a small you know flower pot or, or something that's you know gallon size or less um it, it would need to be five gallons to have enough root volume to, to make the plant grow because you're talking one plant per Per container, not two plants. So it's got to be one one squash plant per <clears throat> per container. I think it may make more sense to grow a summer squash in a container like a zucchini or or something like that, or a yellow summer squash because they're sort of a bush plant. They grow in sort of a bush. If you if you if you're talking about winter squashes, a lot of them, not all of them, are vining squashes, so they go long distances. I mean, that wouldn't be an issue if you had the space to run the vines or you can even travel some there are some miniature um excellent excellent um, um, um uh, butternut squash varieties that are can be trellis they get miniature size <clears throat> so you know you would you could do a trellis on, on the winter squash but I, I think you know most people that, that grow plants in containers are doing it because they don't have a lot of space so i think they're, i think putting it in a uh, getting a bush variety um, putting in something like a five gallon bucket would be a good, a good way to grow it. But just make sure it doesn't dry out too much um, and make sure you have that drainage hole. Yeah. And we'll, we'll make this our final question. Uh, Iris Pridemore wants to know, how do I keep squash borers from killing my squash this summer? Yeah, that's a big problem. I, I, 
there's a lot of issues with squash war. And it's, it's an interesting insect because sometimes it's worse in certain parts of West Virginia than others. Um, I'm not an entomologist, but my, you know, sort of anecdotal uh, experience with this insect is it seems like it repeats itself in the same garden or location year after year. So, it, so sometimes, you know, if you've never seen it, you may not, you may not you may not ever see it, but your neighbor down the road may have a problem with it every year. <clears throat> so it bores, you know, it's a wasp. Um, it has, you know, I think black wings and clear wings on it. Um, it's going to lay its eggs at night and it lays the eggs at the base of the plant. And then they bore right in the, the larvae bore right into the stem of the squash and then the whole plant collapses. Um, it's not usually every plant, but it could be, you know, a significant number of plants damaged. And there's no way to salvage the plant after it's been um, infected or attacked by the, the larvae. So you you have to sort of um, you know know your enemy. So how does this how does this um, uh, insect attack the plant? Well, it always lays its eggs at the base of the plant. You know it doesn't lay its eggs you know at the top of the plant or middle part of the plant. It chooses to go right at the soil line. So if you could put some sort of um, buffer uh, around the plant, tin foil or or um, you know, um, pantyhose or whatever you want to use, something that's a, a, a barrier to that insect ovipositing or laying eggs on the stem, that would work. Okay, that's the non-chemical approach. There are no genetic varieties that are resistant to squash fine borer, so you really can't look at genetics. You're just looking at you know, possibly uh, creating a barrier. The chemical approach is, is you know, not always the, what I recommend all the time. But I mean, um, if one were to use something like um, seven insecticide, you could direct the spray at the base of the plant um, and that would repel um, that insect if you did that. I suppose you could also use some, I've, I've never used some of these organic products. There's, there's you know, um, surround, which is a calcitic clay material that could be sprayed, it, it's mixed in water. It could be sprayed on the base of the plant. But man, again, the, the way I would, approach it is to focus on you know protecting the bottom of the plant from uh, from them laying eggs on it but it, it's a really it's a really demoralizing uh, pet insect because um, you often don't see the damage until the plant's pretty well grown and um, then there's no way to, sometimes it's too late to replant and um, there's no way to salvage uh, or save the plant yeah that that does sound pretty demoralizing <laughs> Yeah, it's 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 made a lot of people not want to grow squash again, you know. So, yeah. Uh, but um, I, I I'll just also add this. I think there are um, uh, traps that can be bought for this wasp or for this insect. So I, I, it may be possible to buy um, these. Uh, I'm not sure it's a pheromone trap. But it's it's a trap that attracts them and would would. would you could catch them and not, you know, not have them available or released around the garden to do the damage. So gardeners may want to look into that. I, I'm not, again, not an entomologist, but uh, there may be um, you know, these, these traps. We do use traps for cucumber beetles all the time. So there are cucumber beetle traps, certainly the Japanese beetle traps. So there are insect traps that home gardeners can buy. And I, I think they could investigate a little bit more into maybe getting a squash line bore trap and see if one um, is out there. Well, Dr. Jet, thank you so much again for, for joining us for this Ask the Expert. Thank you. Um, I'm sure as we go on, <laughs> there will be plenty more questions that folks have. So if, if uh, we might be calling you again. Well, we, we want more people gardening in the state. We, we love gardeners. I mean, we want people growing their own food and growing food for the neighbors and the communities. So any way we can make it easier for them to do it, uh, I think that's the way to go. So I'm, I'm hoping everybody has a great gardening season season and we'll do repeated maybe more of these ask the experts as we go along and, and answer other types of questions <laughs> we'll hold you to that thank you so much have a have a good rest of your day all right thank you Zach. i'll talk to you later Bye. later, later.